blessing. Good to be with you. Boy, when he said that, that made me feel really old all of a sudden. That, holy cow. You can turn to Genesis chapter 2. Do you realize that right now you are as close to God as you want to be? You say, no, preacher, I, I want to be closer. Well, God says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. If you want to be closer, all you got to do is draw nigh to him, and he'll get closer to you. So you're as close right now as what you really do want to be. You can't blame your friends. You can't blame your mom and dad. You can't blame the school. You can't blame your teachers. You only got one person, and that's that person you look in the mirror. That if you're not as close to God as you think you want to be, that you're the only person who can do something about it. And you could do it today. Let me ask this question. How many here, you were brought up in a Christian home? Would you raise your hand? You were brought up in a Christian home. That's marvelous. This message is for you today. I was not. I am a first generation Christian. I was brought up in a drunkard's household, and I don't say that disparagingly for my mom and dad. They were lost. They did not know any better. They were factory workers. They were not brought up to have anything to do with God. As a matter of fact, when my dad was a little boy, he was the 11th of 11 children. When he was a little boy, he went to a little country church not too far from the farm that my grandpa worked. And he came back that uh, Sunday after church, and over the dinner table, he started talking about some of the things that he had heard. And my grandpa said, we're not going to have any blankety-blank, and you know those blankety-blanks were not good words. We're not going to have any blankety-blank preachers in this house. And he forbid my father to go back, and he didn't. Now, what's interesting about that is out of the 11 children, my dad was the 11th. There were seven boys. He was the only boy that had a boy. So needless to say, in my first few years of life, my grandpa spoiled me rotten. I mean, I mean, I was his only, at that time, I was his only Allison grandson. Now, their daughters had children, but of course they had different last names. And isn't it interesting that the only Allison grandson that my grandfather knew is today a preacher. Now, God did something about that, didn't he? So I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. And I guess if I have any problem, well, I know I've got a bunch of problems. But if I, if, if I had any real problem in dealing with a crowd like this, is the fact that since I didn't get saved till I was 22, and I wished I could have known him a lot earlier, that would have spared me from a lot of things that I can't wipe out of my mind today. It would have been, I would have been able to ground myself so much more. The reality is I don't have a lot of patience for people brought up by Christian moms and dads, and yet they're always struggling and complaining about the fact they can't do everything they want to do. You see, I don't understand that. I praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that whereas I didn't know, I didn't have a Christian home to be brought up in, my daughters had nothing but a Christian home to be brought up in. And they're both serving the Lord today, and that's a great blessing. Well, this message will help you. This message will help you all of your life if you'll get this. This message will help you 40 years from now. Not because it's my message. Not because I'm the one who's preaching it. It's just that the truth of this message is so powerful, so many people miss it. I think some miss it on purpose, but if you get it, you will save yourself a boatload of problems throughout your life. In Genesis chapter 2, I did say Genesis, didn't I? Verse 15, I don't know, I'm losing everything today. I had pills in my hand one minute, lost them the next, scoured the room four times, still can't find them. Maybe I took them all. I may pass out before I'm done here. Chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now the title of this message is, I am sick and tired of the rules. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I beg you again for the filling of the Holy Ghost of God. Lord, help me, I pray, to be a help to each of these young people that are here. It's a shame that so many people never get this, and so many people, when they do get it, they've already caused themselves so many problems that they have regrets the rest of their life. So, Father, please, may they get it young and early that it may help their life to glorify my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for it is in his name that I ask it. Amen. Sick and tired of the rules. Sick and tired of the rules for a number of reasons. I mean, how many times have I heard it? I'll guarantee your pastor's heard it. I'll guarantee you the staff has heard it. I just cannot have any fun with all these rules. I mean, there's rules for everything. There's rules and things that we do and things that don't seem to matter. There are rules about everything, and with every rule, there's some kind of a punishment. You just can't enjoy your Christian life because of all these rules. You know, there are a lot of people who think that rules make life miserable. If that's the case, then why is it so many people flock to places like Soldier Field in Chicago or Wrigley Field or down to watch the Colts play there in Indianapolis. I mean, why is it that thousands of people throughout the year go to professional college basketball games, high school basketball games? Why is it that so many people play these games when all of these games have rules? And they put people out there on the field or on the court to make sure that everyone obeys the rules. Isn't it interesting that when you're playing in a sports contest, you want the officials to call every violation that the other team makes? And boy, it can ruin your spirit if the other team gets away with anything. Because you know the rules. They know the rules. They're cheaters. Why are those refs so blind? I've heard this before in basketball games. They had, we had 14 fouls called on us, and they only had three called on them. Well, maybe you're a dirtier team. I mean, really, that doesn't mean the referee was showing favorites. It means they saw all your violations. The other team was sneakier than you are. But we want the rules to be enforced when it's everybody else. And have you ever noticed, even in a high school game, even even in a junior game, you take basketball. Here's the guy. He's dribbling the ball. He's going down the court. The closer he gets to the out-of-bounds line, the more the referee watches his feet. Because as soon as... Just the outside of his tennis shoe touches that out of bounds line. The whistle blows out of bounds. Other way, he's not afraid to embarrass that player in front of the thousands of people that are in the stands. If it's a college game, if it's a if it's a professional game, not only thousands that are in the stands, but millions that are out there watching on TV. Man, they'll call a foul. They'll point the guy out. They will give his number so that everybody can get it. And then the other team gets a shot and it's his fault. And they don't care if that guy's embarrassed or not. Must be fundamentalist. (laughs) The rules. Matter of fact, I did a little web search on uh, rules. Of course, every sport has rules. But do you know, toe wrestling... Now, I don't even know what that is. But toe wrestling has rules. I, now, I know Legos are a toy that people play with. But do you know that there is a league called the First Lego League? And there is a whole page on rules to play Legos? 
When I was a kid, I played marbles, and I thought the rules were the ones we made up. But you get on the Internet, you find out there's a page of rules to play marbles. There's rules for everything. Go into Toys R Us. And you can find a game section. And do you know what every one of those games have in common? They all have rules. As a matter of fact, every game is defined by its rules. All I have to do is tell you the rules about some things, and you can identify what sport it is without me ever telling you. Rules, part of life. It's not only part of the sports world, and it's not only part of games. It is in every part of life. Every country, every state, every city, every town, every incorporation, they all have any entity whatsoever, whether they're incorporated or unincorporated, they all have rules. You realize when the car was invented, they had to come up with another list of rules? Because they didn't have rules for cars until they had cars. And so then they had to come up with rules so that you knew when you could cross the street. And you knew where you were supposed to drive. I mean, that's just the way it is. It's part of life. Do you realize that the government has rules about your money? You can't just do anything with your money you want to do with it. You buy certain things with your money and they find out about it, you're going to jail. You say, but it's my money. I earned it. Yeah, but there's some things you can't do with that money. Not only that, the government says, you make our money, you got to give us back some. And they tell you how much you got to give back. And if you don't give it back, you'll lose your house, you'll lose your car, you'll lose your home. I mean, you can lose your livelihood, you can lose everything if you don't keep their rules as far as money is concerned. And when it comes to making money, and of course to help the economy go, you want to make money, but there are certain things you cannot do in order to make money. There's all kinds of rules about your money. I own a house. We bought it. And the government says I have to pay taxes on it. If I don't, I lose my house. Now they call it taxes. I look at it as rent. I mean, I, I'm amazed in some state, my taxes are fairly cheap compared to most people, but my house, the size of my house in the state of Wisconsin would cost me over $6,000 a year in taxes. That's, I, that means they have to pay the government over $100 a week just to live in their own house. It's that way in the state of Pennsylvania. Probably that way in the state of Illinois. I mean, I don't have to pay them. I have to pay $10 a week to live in my own house. So I get a pretty good break on that, don't I? I'm just simply saying there are rules for everything. Every business has rules. You go down to McDonald's and get a job at McDonald's. You can't dress any way you want to dress. You've got to dress according to their uniform. You go to, you go to Burger King. You've got to dress according to their uniform, bunch of legalists. By the way, you know what a legalist is? When you hear somebody calling some other church a legalist church, you know what that means? Here's, here's what it means. It means they have rules I don't have. That's all that it means. It means they have rules I don't have. Somebody has a higher rule, they must be a legalist. What about your rules? Well, hey, I'm a Bible scholar. My rules are right. And they think theirs are right. Rules. Now, rules, part of life. I don't know if you knew this or not. But do you know there are rules for war? Even in war, you just can't drop bombs any place you want to drop them. If you do, you better win the war because if you don't, you're going to be tried and probably put to death for breaking the rules of war. We read Genesis chapter 2. God created Adam and Eve. And the first thing we have recorded that he said to Adam after creating him Here's rule number one. You can eat of everything, but there's one tree you can't eat of. The day you eat of it, you die. Now think about that, one rule. I doubt there ever would have been another rule had they kept the one rule. But they couldn't keep the one rule. And so now, since that lays on us a sinful nature, there has to be literally millions of rules in life Otherwise, we'd be killing one another. Do you realize without rules and without their enforcement, you couldn't go outside of your house? As a matter of fact, you'd have to have guards up 24-7, and even then, 
you would not be safe. Thank God for rules that allow you to even live. Rules are necessary. You say, why do you hate rules? Well, let me give you one reason I hate rules. I hate rules because people are going to break them. I don't care what the rule is. I don't care how good it is. People are going to break the rules. You say, no, no, I only break those ones that don't matter. Really? A lawyer came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 22 and said, what's the great commandment? Now, this is big because if you're going to keep the great commandment, I mean, after all, that's, that's one you better for sure get right. Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Do you realize <clears throat> you can't say an ugly word, loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind? You can't have bitterness in your heart toward anybody, loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You can't sit there and look at dirty pictures, loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You can't participate in gossip, loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You can't tell an, an exaggeration, loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The reality is, everybody here has broken the greatest rule that God has. And not just once, but thousands upon thousands of times in your lifetime. That's why we need a Savior. That's why when God says all have sinned to come short of the glory of God, He's not just talking about little bitty things. They've all broken. We've all broken the greatest command of God. Jeremiah 4.22 says, For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sadish children. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. What is amazing is, no matter what the rules are, the simplest of rules, you know people are going to break them. Now, at our place, we have a gym. And we didn't build the gym as a play place for people. We were using it for our school. And possibly times for fellowship. But you know, when we built the gym, we found out real quick we had to have some rules. And we tried to come up with some simple rules. Now, because we're paying the electric bill. In our gym, we have those nice big halogen lights that are hanging from the ceiling. They're kind of expensive. But with each of those lights, there were also emergency lights that burned bright and hot. You turned on the halogen lights with one set. You turned on the emergency lights with a second set of switches. And so we had a rule. Don't touch the emergency lights. Plenty of lights for people to play in the gym with just the regular halogen lights. But I would come in after some men would play basketball on Friday night, and I would notice the emergency lights are on too. We're paying the electricity bill. We provided a place for them to be able to play. And all we asked was, don't touch the halogen lights. We had to end up putting a box around the halogen lights because people couldn't keep that simple rule. We have, around our gym, we've got water fountains. And our gym is right next to the kitchen. And so I came in one Saturday morning after we allowed the people to play on Friday night, and I noticed there were styrofoam cups all over the gym. Those were our cups. We bought those cups with God's money for church fellowship times and so on. They don't need the cups. They've got the drinking fountains right there. So I made a rule. Don't go into the kitchen. You don't need the kitchen. You're here to play basketball. We don't play basketball in the kitchen. Don't touch the cups. Next Saturday, cups out again. Next rule, no more basketball. Because you're so rebellious, you can't keep a simple rule. We're trying to be nice to you and good to you and allow you to be able to do something. And here you are, you can't keep the simplest of rules. You would think if somebody would let you use their property for something that could be a blessing and a help to you, that at least you'd obey what rules they had. Simplest of rules. People can't keep them. We had another rule. Don't mess with the thermostat. Now, normally... Now, I'm a fat person, so when I played basketball, I, I played it to help me lose weight. And so with it being a little warm in the gym, that's a good thing because you sweat. I'm sorry. For you ladies, you perspire. And I'd go in there on Saturday morning, and the thermostat would be down to 60. 
It had run that way all night long because they got a little warm playing basketball. They turned, turned the thermostat down, and they thought that if they turned it down to 60, it would cool off faster. It doesn't. The thermostat, your air conditioner, will cool it off at a certain rate, whether you set it 64, 62, 60, or as low as you can go. Now, it will cool it off more, get it way down there, but it cools at the same rate. Don't touch the thermostat. Next Saturday, 60 degrees. We're paying the utility bill. Simple rule. Simple rule. We didn't, these were not the heathen that were playing. These were members of Madison Baptist Church. Next Sunday, no more basketball. For three months, nobody goes in there. You can't keep a simple rule. I'm simply saying, whatever rule you make, people are going to break them. Number two, rules make people angry. I mean, really. For instance, go over to chapter 4, the book of Genesis. Notice it says in verse 3, And in process of time it came to pass, that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the first thing of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Now, God asked him an interesting question. Why are you angry, Cain? You see, God had taught Adam and Eve about the necessity of a blood sacrifice when he killed the animals and made coats for them. No doubt they had taught that to their sons. How do you know? Abel brought the right kind of sacrifice. And when Cain brought the wrong sacrifice and God didn't have respect to it, Cain was raw and he says, hey, you do right, you'll be okay. But if not, sin lieth at the door. And Cain's angry. Why is he angry? I mean, after all, young people, if your parents say that you can drive the car, but you can only drive it to school, you can't go off to, uh, to McDonald's, and you stop at McDonald's, they take the car away from you, why would you be mad at them? You broke the rule. When you do something that you've been told not to do, don't get mad at the punishment that you got. You decided that that would happen to you when you broke the rule. So here's Cain. He's mad. He's mad at the rule giver. He's mad at the rule enforcer. Now, even though we definitely want referees out there on the basketball court with us when we're playing basketball because of that dirty team that we're playing, who are the people that are the most hated on the basketball court? The referees. Anybody here a soccer player? Do we have any soccer players here? I'll tell you, one thing I would never be is a soccer referee in Europe or Latin America. Their life expectancy is about two-thirds of a game. <laughs> they hate those guys. They want to kill those guys. Why? Those men are out there to enforce the rules. And you see, when we make rules, you hear people say, well, I don't know why they have that rule down there at that church. Well, I know the they that they're talking about is me. I'm the pastor. I pretty much have decided what the rules are going to be. They're mad at me. I don't like people being mad at me. I am such a good guy. That's not funny. That's true. <laughs> but they get mad. Do you know when they get madder, though? When we punish them for not obeying the rules. And guess who they're mad at again? People are mad at the police. Stop you for speeding. I don't know why they're not out there catching the real criminals. What's your definition of a criminal? Somebody breaks the law. Well, you just broke it, dummy. That's why you got caught. <laughs> I mean, come on. Do you realize the policeman didn't make the speed limit? He's there to enforce the speed limit. And when you speed, you're simply getting what you deserve. Don't get mad at him. He's doing his job. And if we didn't have policemen out there, you wouldn't want to get on the road. You'd get killed because there's so many jerks that don't care who's out there or who they kill or who they destroy. I want a policeman out there catching the drinking driver. Or the high driver. I want them out there. 
You can't live in your society without the police. But boy, when they got your number, now they're the bad guys. No, you were the bad guy. I'm simply saying, no matter what rules you come up with, people are going to break them. And on top of that, they're going to get angry at the people who made the rule and the people who enforced the rule. I think here's the reason we hate the rules the most. They show us for what we are. In Romans chapter 7, Paul said, I had not known sin except the law said. You see, the word of God shows us we're sinners. That's what it does. That's why in Galatians 3.24, he says the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after the faith has come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. You see, that law was there to show us that we are sinners. I don't know if you realize this or not, but the rules of this school show you for what you are. I mean, if you're one of those people, you're always on the edge. You're sometimes just overseeing what you can get away with. All you're doing is telling everybody without saying it with your mouth that you are a rebel. That's what you're doing. And when people label you as a rebel, when that's exactly what you've been telling them you are by how you acted toward the rules, don't get mad at them. Accept it, own it, and say, I don't want to be known a rebel. I'm going to get right. I'm going to change my attitude. You see, your problem is not rules. Your problem's you. My problem's me. Because I've got this flesh on me that does not like the rules. Do you know that we could empty all the prisons today? All we have to do is take away all the laws. We should let every murderer go. The reason they're in jail is because they broke the law that said you're not to murder. Every thief, they broke a law that said, well, I don't believe you ought to legislate morality. Every law is a legislation of morality. Somebody's morality. Do you really want all the murderers and the thieves and the child abusers, do you really want them all let go? Well, I just think they ought to have the rules that I agree with. Well, when you get elected to Congress, maybe you can pass the ones you agree with. But until then, you've got to live in a society where you have to keep the rules or you face the consequences. God has rules. God, and he has consequences. He said right there in Genesis chapter 2, he said, You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you do, you what? They didn't chop the tree down. They didn't harvest all the fruit off the tree and carry it off and steal it and sell it at the farmer's market. As far as we know, they took one piece of fruit, they ate, they died, and everybody's had to die since then because of that one act. I don't call that a little sin. That's gigantic. You said it doesn't seem big to me. You're the one that's got the problem. Seems like having rules only encourages people to do wrong. Like, for instance, speed limits. Now, I've been around for a while. We've seen speed limits change. You go back to the early 1970s, and on most of the interstates, it was 70 miles an hour. Now, I know that's the same way today. But there was a time during the Carter administration, the latter part of the 1970s, before most of you were born, when they had lowered the, the speed limits to 55 around the country, all the interstates. Now, when the speed limit was 70, people drove 75. Speed limit is 55, even though everybody's crying and complaining, they drove 60 and 65. Now they were driving less than what they drove at 70, but they're still breaking the law. Reagan comes into office, and when Reagan comes into office, they put the speed limits back where they were at 70. Well, now everyone's happy. The speed limits are back where they were. No, they're now driving 75. And if you're around Atlanta, 80 and 85. Do you know why? <laughs> it's because we see the rule and we just don't like it that somebody's telling us no. You just can't do what you want. Now, if you want to help yourself for the rest of your life, you need to learn some things about the rules. By the way, this is important about rules is they reflect the values of the people in power. For instance, if you were to go to Saudi Arabia today or go to Iran, do you know there that if a young lady or an older woman makes no difference, 
if they are raped by some wicked man that the woman is put to death? The woman is put to death. You say, well, that's not right. Common sense, yeah, but that's their value system. You see, their rules simply follow their value system. You really want them to be in power? I mean, it doesn't alarm you that we have a president that's bringing them in by the thousands and dispersing them among the states, and in some parts of America even, those parts of America are under Sharia law, which would allow them to have those honor kill. I'm just simply saying that rules exhibit the value system of the one in power. Our God is holy, and his rules show his holiness. So we ought to long to obey him. Rules also reflect the depravity of man. They show us for what we are. You say, man, I, I don't like that. I know. But you know, without rules, bullies rule. You ever played basketball? I mean, guys and gals play it, not basketball, uh, volleyball together. And for some reason, when guys and gals are playing volleyball together, the guys think that there are no rules. Maybe young ladies play with some jerks like that. Oh, nobody here, I'm sure. <laughs> These would all be gentlemen playing their own position, hitting the ball correctly, <laughs> never reaching over the net, trying to smash it down into your face because you're a weak little puny girl and he wants you to know it. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Every time I preach this message, whenever I get to that part, people always look at certain individuals. <laughs> I could tell you exactly who they are in this room. But without rules, bullies rule. Without rules, mafia takes over. Without rules, man, you have no freedom. And here's the thing. It is impossible to enforce all of the rules without people thinking that you're showing partiality. And there's nothing to do about it. What they don't realize is you can only punish the ones you catch, and some people are just sneakier than others. Some people will get away with things for a while, and you say, oh, it's not fair. I got caught, and, and, and I've seen them do it over and over and over again. It was a preacher's kid, too. Well, preacher kids know how to be sneaky. So do deacon kids. Preacher kids would be okay if it wasn't for those deacon kids. But the Sunday school teacher kids, they're the worst. I mean, really, sneaky. But if they get caught, yeah, rules. You know, at our place, I have three main rules that guide all of our rules. Number one, some rules are there because the Bible says some things are right and some things are wrong, and we're going to do what's right in God's eyes. That's number one. Number two, I've been at this thing for 40-some years. We have a Christian school at our place. We have rules. I found out that some things work and some things don't. We're going to do what works. Now, first, God's word. Secondly, what works. Thirdly, there are some things where simply somebody's got to draw the line someplace. And I believe in drawing the line where we're going to enforce it. Now, you take the length of the men's hair. For instance, is, it, is a man in deep sin if that hair just touches the ear? No, that's not really sin. How about if it's an eighth, and an eighth of an inch over the year? How about if it's a quarter of an inch over the year? How about if it's two inches down over the year? No, the preacher, that'd be wrong. Oh, see, you just draw your line in a different place, that's all. I tell you, I'm going to draw the line where I can most easily enforce it. And so what I do is I say, if it touches the ear, you get a grooming slip. you got to get a cut. Because it's easy to see. We don't have to get out a ruler and measure it. If it touches the collar, you get a grooming slip. Easy to see. We tell the young ladies their skirts have to be at the bottom of the knee or longer. I don't care how much longer, but the bottom of the knee or longer. So if it's just a third of the way up the knee, they can't wear that again until they get it fixed. It's easy to tell. You say, does that mean it's a sin if it's just a tenth of an inch above? No, but they've broken the rule and they get a grooming slip. Somebody had to draw the line. I'm the guy who drew them, and we're going to enforce it where I drew them. One day, you may be a teacher, or you may be a pastor, or you may be an administrator, 
And guess what? People are going to be mad at you when they break the rules. And people are going to give you a hard time. And I don't care where you draw your line. People are going to hate you for the line. Now, if you'll learn this, this can help you for the rest of your life. The rest of your life. It can make your high school days so much more fun. Not nearly as troublesome. Make your college days a time where you can major on learning instead of looking at all the things that you don't like. Man, grow up. You're here because you haven't matured completely yet. And this is to help you mature. Get it. But I just don't like it. Who does? Thank Father Adam for that. That's the reason all those rules are there. But to live, we've got to have them. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would deal with our hearts. I pray right now there might be some young person who recognizes that that bad attitude toward rules is them. It's their heart. And before they allow their heart to get poisoned, By a wrong attitude, God, I pray they'd come and get right with you today. It's a shame Adam couldn't keep one rule. And we have trouble keeping the rules even when they're there for our safety and there for our good and there for our help and there for our development and there for our character. God, I pray that every young person here would cry out to you and say, God, please, I don't want a cane heart. I I, I don't want to be one of those rebels. I want to live for you completely. I thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ showed us, as far as your word's concerned, he obeyed every bit of it, and he never saw it as bondage, but freedom. God, have your way in every life, and Lord, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Listen. (laughs)